It's about the recent book, Imagining Pakistan, Modernism, State, and the Politics of Islamic Revival. Before, by Mr. Rasul Baksh Raiz himself. And uh, before I start asking questions, I would ask one question. Mr. Raiz, do you think this book could have been written 10 years ago or 15 years ago? I think it should have been written much earlier. Uh, the question that um, I have tried to explore in, uh, in this book and try to answer in this book is that what has gone wrong with Pakistan? That is a question that I... And there has been... Uh, There has been a big tragedy in East Pakistan, uh, becoming Bangladesh. A book like this must have been written at that point. There have been many junctures in our history when I thought that, um, that those who perhaps were wanting to engage with this question, should have tried to answer this question. So I have tried to, to answer that question in my own way, but, but I think it could be written much earlier. You have <clears throat> basically gone into detail uh, this debate that what Pakistan was meant to be and didn't became that. Hmm. Uh, it's like, for example, a lot of people when they raise this question, hmm. it's between a secular Pakistan and um, Islamic Pakistan, when we know the truth basically is that it's always been about a more, let's say, so-called modernist version of Islam and a more theological version. Tussle in dono ke beech mein hai. And so you've tried to sort of discuss exactly kya tha and you also mark that 1949 objectives revolution ki wajah se the, the divergence became, uh, came too early. Do you think debate is the same? I think that, like, for example, when this debate is the same, and the theological people, when they think that they don't have enough uh, arguments, they start using words like, oh, this is secular, this is liberal, to distract the, uh, the, the, the debate. Actually, there has been a debate, but there should have been a discourse. The discourse is something very different. You engage in argument, you engage in logic, you engage in philosophy, you engage in history. You engage in facts. The debate is about you are wrong, I am right. Okay. And there you lose the argument. Uh, my basic argument is, which is the beginning and which is the end, that Pakistan was imagination of Muslim modernists. Mm -hmm. So here yeah, we have to understand the time, the context, the history, the social and political transformations that were taking place in mostly in the later part of 19th century and subcontinent. And in that context, we have to understand Muslim modernism. And the question, I think, in the late 19th century, as it is today, is a question of Muslim empowerment. Muslim preoccupation with the idea how we can find our last glory, our heritage. What has happened to us? That was the question. And there were two answers. Simply, I don't want to get into the detail. The two answers was, uh, one was, uh, uh, let me take it in, uh, consider it in the, in the light of politics, the politics of Muslim revival, Deoband. We have lost everything because, of, because we have lost religion. This argument is very important even today. The second argument was that, um, well, we have to understand our causes more deeply, more reflectively. And the answer was Aligarh, Answer was Muslim rationalism, Muslim modernism. Answer was Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan and many others. 
And of course, uh, if when you understand Muslim modernism, you have to understand what modernity in the Western context was. It is ideas, ideologies, philosophy, education, science, technology. Please keep in mind, Muslim modernism was primarily about understanding usefulness and its application of science. 19, I think it was in 1866 that Muslim scientific society was established in Alibaba. What Muslim scientific society was doing? Obtaining scientific journals in the Western countries, translating them into Urdu language, making it accessible, making science popular. Empowerment requires enlightenment. Empowerment requires education, modern education. That how you are relevant to your own times. Kadiazam, oh, sorry, I'm talking about uh, Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan, Shibli Nomani, Halim, yeah. and many of those. They were contextualized in the Islamic history and the Islamic civilization. But simply they wanted to make religion and Muslims relevant to the times that they had changed. You, you, if you explore, explore the subject of modernity, four or five things, particularly in the context of today, and I would like to conclude my argument here, is that it is about representation, it is about freedom, it is about equality, it is about rationality and rationalism, it is about rule of law, it is about what we call democracy. So it's not all materialism, Westernism and secularism. It is much more in terms of set of ideas that that, that, that basically reflect what individualism is and what freedom and liberty to individualism is. Here, I, I, I think, when I, when I just conclude my argument before I do that, there, there is some misunderstanding about secularism. When you say, I'm a secularist, it means that you don't have any religion. Secularism is a philosophy. It's a very deep philosophy, it's that a history, long history of ideas behind it. You cannot really reject or trash secularism by saying that it's a uh, Urdu translation of Ladinia. No, it's not. Secularism is that, that where you situate religion and where you state power and politics. These are two different realms. And when they mix up what they do, should they mix up? Or they should be two different realms. My own belief is, you may consider me secular. I'm secular. Secular in the sense that I believe that the right place of religion is not in the state. The right place of religion is in the society. That is a better custody, custodian of religious heritage and and, and ideas than the state itself. State is something about pragmatic politics, about things that we can do and the things that we must do. And, and of course, what, what you don't understand is that appropriation of religion by temporal authority, which is the state itself, it's appropriate religion, it becomes tenerical. Look at history. History of Christianity and how that the transition then, the transition from a tyrannical religious state to a democratic state took place over a long period of time after so many struggle, struggles. So here, again, the, the other misunderstanding about religion and politics in Pakistan and Muslim society is that we can be a better Muslim if becoming a better Muslim becomes a responsibility of the state. We are in the world. Any state, any temporal authority can make a person religious. 
it, it is an inner calling. It, it is the inner conviction. So I, I engage with these arguments, but I, I, I believe that I mean, we have to consider, I think, when we talk about, we, we expand the discussion, what has happened to that modernist project? Where we have lost, you mentioned by objective resolution, the, you know, the best debates took place on objective resolution, and there is no reference in any book. Who talked about what? I had the opportunity to look at the arguments of uh, three of the Hindu Ji. representatives in the Constituent Assembly, who happened to be from East Pakistan. And they engaged with uh, Ishtiakusen, Dr. Ishtiakusen at that time, uh, with Liaquat Ali Khan Saab, and uh, with Maulana Shabira Madhusmani at that time. They engaged with them that, look, with this objective resolution, and then saying that sovereignty belongs to Allah, but then that sovereignty is expressed through, um, through men and women in the society. What is it that you want to do? So um, we have to look at that erosion of modernist tradition that has taken place. And I look at four or five factors. One, the military takeover by Ayub Khan. Objective resolution is, is the beginning. And then it's not only the military itself which, which represents our together very different model of state, society, and nation. And, and it starts with this basic and wrong assumption that this society is not prepared and good enough for running such a great thing like democracy. We have to prepare society for that. A kind of a colonial outlook that runs from, from uh, Ayub Khan to Musharraf. That, that we have to create those conditions which the British used to give that argument that we have to create conditions for a responsible government before we transfer power to these people. They are not ready for that. That, again, uh, so the illegitimacy vacuum that has been created, my argument is, that has been captured by Islamic radicalists. Now, when you talk about Islam, there's a long chapter on that. I look at three waves. I consider jamaat islami I consider jamiyat e ulama islam and many of those who have accepted constitutional politics as institutionalists. They, they belong to the category of, of, of political Islam. They believe in, in the creation of Islamic State. I think they have right, they have, they, they have that constitutional right to pursue that. Right? I may not agree with them, but they have that right to pursue it. They are institutionalists. That there is a second way, which is basically jihadists. The third one is radical. We are in that phase of radicalism, and I consider that the enemy is within, because this radical radicalism of any form does not believe in, in the peaceful, constitutional, legal means accessing power. But they, require, they, th they think that the ends justify the means. If violence, if destruction, if terrorism is the best means to achieve an Islamic state, that is fine. That is jihad. That is holy and that is sacred, things like that. Last thing, that I believe that everything is not lost in Pakistan. Very, I'm very optimistic. Four or five factors that I talked about, that a pluralistic, democratic Pakistan can be created. If you look at media, if you look at the history of freedom and democracy in this, con this country, and I, I consider uh, some, some, some positive things uh, in, in, in the colonial modernity. I don't reject colonial modernity as, as everything irrelevant. As a post-colonialist, I will object to robbing our culture, our history and domination, everything. But then some consequences, positive consequences of colonial extraction have happened, particularly the history of freedom, the history of liberalism, history of democracy. And, and, and if you look at that heritage that we have in subcontinent, that is good enough for building democracy as we do in transitional society. Thank you. Thank you, Riza. Uh, Salman, you have been, you are a well-known lawyer. You have you're written a lot about constitutional politics as well. If you agree with, with this thesis that Pakistan was the outcome of a modernist Islamic uh, uh, project, uh, that starting with the 1956 constitution uh, was never expressed legis through legislation. Uh, 
you see the 1956 constitution where we are declared as an Islamic Republic, but not explain exactly what we mean by that. The 1973 uh, 73, uh, constitution, uh, you were again declared that, and you tried to sort of uh, add in certain, certain uh, aspects of what you think an Islamic Republic sh or democratic Islamic Republic should be. But from the 1980s onwards, we keep talking about constitutionalism, how important it is, but the constitution as it stands today has created a lot of problems for the civil society, for politicians, even for the establishment as well, because as we have seen that after the tragic APS um, uh, attack, there are some, certain elements within the establishment which wanted to change the narrative, which, which, which they once stood for. The civil society, of course, wanted to change that. The politicians wanted to bring change, but <coughs> it becomes very easy for a lot of people who doesn't want that change to use certain constitutional uh, 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 clauses and laws and uh, the, the courts have no, uh, no power to sort of turn them over. You cannot do that. So be, be, uh, do you think we, we've been entrapped by our own constitution? Well, uh, let me come to the constitution in a moment. But the constitution that we have today and the changes that have happened and the debates that we have in the courts today are really reflective, I think, of the last 70, 80, 90 years of our uh, uh, larger public political discourses in South Asia. So we have this narrative. Now, there are two competing narratives that we put out. One is the narrative so ably put out by Rasul Bakhsh Raisab in this book, Imagining Pakistan, that I recommend to everybody. But let me add a caveat to this. This is the standard, if you like, progressive, secular narrative. That Pakistan was the outcome of some modernist, progressive uh, conception of Muslim empowerment. That conception of Muslim empowerment got hijacked, you know, and the symptoms of that hijack were the objectives resolution and the various martial laws, the nods in the various constitutions towards, um, if you like, uh, theological uh, conceptions of the state, and then with Zia you know, a much more pervasive infusion of uh, religion into our lives so that today the constitution as it exists is something that Hafiz Said can own. He says, I stand for the constitution, I stand for Jinnah's Pakistan, I stand for Iqbal's Pakistan. So all of those slogans that previously were the secular modernists uh, kind of preserve are now so easily appropriated by everybody and in particular by those that... Uh, Rasul Bakhsh Sahib has described as institutional Islamists, jihadi Islamists, and even the radical Islamists who are a version of some kind of um, anarchists, if you like. So really, I think we need to now go beyond merely this, if you like, topographical description of our history. We need to scratch the surface and ask ourselves, why are we where we are? And it is not just because the objectives resolution was passed or because there were martial laws or because there was, yeah. I would contend that the causes are much deeper, and they are both intellectual and psychological. And unless and until we engage with those deeper causes, simply blaming the objectives resolution or Zia or whoever will not function, will not really take us very far. Today, if a young person or a not so young person wishes to educate himself about what is it that the state should look like, what will he turn to? Will he turn to Hobbes and uh, John Stuart Mill, to uh, educate himself as to what the state should be doing? Or will he turn to Madhudi and, uh, if you like, Taki Usmani and so on? How do you tell this person that this is what you should be reading mm. and this is the conception that you should be adopting? My bet is that, given the language, given the emotional, if you like, uh, uh, consonants, he's as likely to be reading Madhudi, Jihad Fil Islam, or Madhudi's uh, conception of a modern welfare state, as he is uh, likely to be reading any of the Enlightenment philosophers that we think should animate our larger, if you like, uh, conception of democracy and the state. Now, when he reads those texts, he is told that, look, it is not for some intellectual like Rasul Bakhsh Rais to tell you what the role of religion in society should be, what the role of religion in the state should be. Uh, uh, Professor Saab said, I believe that this is the role that religion should have in a state. Now, why should this person have the same belief? When he reads Madhudi, he is told, Khas hai, Tarkib ne, Kaume, Rasule, Hashmi, 
Yas Akwame Maghrib Pinakar. So he says, this is nonsense. They're telling me to become a follower of Hobbes. Why should I? Khas hai tarkib mein qawme rasool Hashmi. Now where does that lead him? So when he starts investigating that, khas hai tarkib mein, Madhudi sahab tells him, democracy is in fact, nahi tehzeeb ke ande hai, gande utha ke, bahar phenk to. So it's one of those ganda andas of modern, uh, modernism and of modern civilization. So there is just so much in our past. Hmm. There is so much that our icons have put out. Jana, Iqbal, you have it. You name it. That it is really simplistic to now imagine a linear move backwards to some kind of a rational modernist Islam emanating out of Sir Sayyid or Aligarh or wherever that can just be adopted with psychological, um, if you like, uh, conviction and um, comfort by the individual today seeking enlightenment, seeking the way, the way forward. So that is not going to happen. No matter how much we urge people how, to keep religion in some demarcated sphere in, in uh, public life, to treat religion as the source of personal salvation, it won't work. The fact of the matter is that we have too much around us now and we have a history that is full of intellectual, political discourse that tells us that religion controls, in fact designates what the state should be doing, what the state should look like, what the economy should look like, riba, and so on. And therefore, you just can't brush all that aside and say this was uh, a lost uh, period of our uh, collective existence and we just need to brush it away and move on and find our original modernist uh, narrative. That is no longer a possibility. So we will have to negotiate through all of this. We will have to engage with the Islamist narrative. We will have to engage with tafsir and hadith and what have you. I see no way forward. It is simply not possible to tell people that please lock away religion in some private sphere. This is not our original conception of the Pakistani state. If you look at what was going on in the 1940s, if you look at the uh, speeches being made by each one of the major uh, figures of the Muslim uh, political movements in uh, South Asia and India, including Mr. Jinnah, you will find a whole lot. So Arya Makhul Jan finds treasure troves mm -hmm. in Jinnah Saab's speeches uh, that he can quote. Safdar Mahmood Saab finds a great deal to uh, rely on as do you and I. So the fact is that we will now need to create our own convictions. We cannot simply remain engaged in, in an archaeological project of a rediscovery of some hidden uh, vision that has become uh, covered with dust over time. We need to create a vision all over again as if it were. And simply pointing to what Jinnah wanted or what Sir Sayyid wanted won't work. Because everybody now looks at Jannah and Sir Sayyid and Iqbal through their own spectacles, through their own prisms. And uh, simply pointing out will not work. So it's a much harder project than um, uh, what we often pretend it is. We think it is just a, a wrong turn in our history. It's not just a wrong turn. It is a series of events, intellectual, psychological, that have brought us where we are. And in order to move forward, we need to engage with each of those events. We need to engage with an entire conception of human existence, life, politics, economics. Okay, well, now the interesting thing about the whole modernism thing is, <clears throat> it also has its own branches. You know, like, that's not one sort of Muslim modernism we talk about, because if we talk about Madhudi Saab, he was also a branch of this modern thinking, because he was also adopting from um, a lot of Western philosophies and ideas. Uh, Hassan, what what we've just discussed, that we need something new now. And it's easier asked than done or answered. Do you think you can answer it in any way? Well, I, I, I don't think I have any ready answers for the way forward, but part of the reason for that, I think, is it's important to understand the long history our state has had in perpetuating precisely the kinds of narratives that, that some would like to counter now. I mean, whenever, whenever this kind of discussion is had, my mind goes back to two things that I uncovered during my own research as part of my own work. One is a letter that I encountered from 1945 in which the governor of Punjab was telling the governor general at the time that he'd had a meeting with Firuz Khan Noon, who had quite clearly said that this entire narrative prior to the elections of 46 about Islam in danger in Pakistan and so on and so forth, was a political tool. It was a means through which to win representation and then put forward 
different kinds of political agendas through which the Muslim League could secure greater rights for Muslims within colonial India. I mean, Feroz Khan Noon, at least in the governor's telling, was quite clear on this fact that he and much of the League's leadership didn't actually believe what they were saying, but they were nonetheless more than willing to employ that kind of idiom as a means through which to secure power. Similarly, in 1952, and those who are interested can find a copy of this report at the National Documentation Center, the Interior Ministry published a report in which it documented the internal threats to Pakistan. And there were a number, you know, there were some familiar subjects. They were afraid of provincialism, they were afraid of communism, but they were also afraid of Islam. Because as the Interior Ministry, as the person compiling the report in the Interior Ministry put it, the problem is, in his opinion, the state could not let this narrative of Islam be taken out of its own hands. It couldn't allow actors in society to hijack that discourse and use it to delegitimize state power. And therefore, the interior ministry was of the opinion that efforts had to be made to ensure the state had a monopoly on this Islamic narrative and that it could be used to strengthen itself. Now, I think this is important because what we find from the very beginning, whether we look at the Islam in danger narrative that was perpetuated in the 1940s, whether we look at the labeling of communists as anti-Islamic, anti-Pakistan in the 50s and 60s, whether you look at ethno-nationalists throughout Pakistan's history and the way in which they've been maligned, again, in terms of Islam, if you look at the incredibly horrific rhetoric employed against Bengali people in 1971 where their Islamic credentials were questioned, if you look at the way in which the discourse around Islam was propagated in the 1980s during the Afghan Jihad, if you look at what's happening today when I can point towards several people at this think fest who have been labeled as traitors, anti-Islamic, uh, treasonous, so on and so forth, what you find is that the state has been complicit in the perpetuation of this kind of narrative. And more importantly, the state continues to use these very same, as Salman and Raja Sahib was saying, the very institutions that you would associate with modernism in order to do this. The law, the media, textbooks, curriculum, all of this is used to perpetuate the idea that Islam is the fundamental ordering principle within Pakistan, is the fundamental source of identity, and it has to be defended at all costs. So one question that occurs to me is, well, why is that the case? And over here, this is where I'd like to, again, raise a couple of questions about Rasul Saab's contention regarding the legacy of colonialism in Pakistan. Because certainly, if you look at the political science literature, you can, you can find arguments that suggest that British colonialism could lay the foundations for a more democratic society because of the way in which they created parliaments, permitted the existence of the press, uh, had constitutions, and so on and so forth. But if you dig a bit deeper, what you generally find is that the entire edifice of colonial rule was built upon the creation of institutions that empowered collaborative local elites usually drawn from the landed classes, but also from other sections of society. And it's precisely that institutional legacy that Pakistan inherited after independence. And one of the contentions I would make is that that kind of authoritarian state structure, which made itself most manifest with the first military takeover by Ayub Khan, but which had always been a part of Pakistan's uh, governing order prior to that as well, what I would argue is that that kind of inherently authoritarian institutional structure is also inherently lacking legitimacy. And Islam provided one of the main ways in which that kind of legitimacy could be acquired. And that is precisely why I feel the state and various leaders, starting from Jinnah and Firoz Khanun and others, all the way up to the present day, have been more than willing to make use of a particularly parochial version of Islam in order to make claims about identity and in order to make claims about India. Whether it's dealing with internal dissent, whether it's about demonizing India, whether it's about justifying various actions taken in the quote unquote national interest, Islam has always been used in an instrumental way in Pakistan. And I think any discussion about what has to be done in society today has to begin with a discussion about what we can do about the state 
what can be done about holding those in power more accountable, and what can be done to question the narratives upon which they attempt to build their legitimacy. One final point I'd like to make before returning the discussion to the panel is just that, um, in a way, part of the problem is also that um, it's very difficult, in some sense, to talk about these things in any meaningful way. Because the story I've been telling so far is one about state control and attempts by the state to monopolize this discourse about Islam for the achievement of particular political objectives. But over time, as we can all see, this discourse assumes a life of its own. It's no longer solely the preserve of the state. There are a multiplicity of groups and actors in society who now claim the very same legitimacy that the state sought to claim for itself by using Islam. And uh, as we all know, whether we're talking about militant Islamist groups, whether we're talking about mainstream Islamist parties, and so on and so forth, many of these groups enjoyed and continue to enjoy the support and patronage of the state in both its civilian and military manifestations, and are now in a position where their position has been so entrenched in society that even the state itself, arguably, cannot really do much about them. It's become a prisoner of the narrative it itself has created over the past seven decades. And so just to conclude, I'll say one last thing. I mean, often, when, whenever there's a terrorist attack of some kind, whenever there's any kind of terrorist atrocity, a question is often raised, well, why doesn't the state do more? And one answer that people continue to provide is, well, maybe it's because the state continues to be complicit in the perpetration of this kind of violence by actively supporting some of the groups that are involved in it. And that's a scary thought. But here's an even scarier thought. What if the state can't do anything about it? What if the state is now so afraid of backlash? What if the state is now so afraid of some kind of reaction from these groups that it finds itself in a position where it cannot do anything but play along, permit sit-ins in Islamabad that last for weeks, not raise a finger to change any kind of religious law, and so on and so forth. I mean, I think we have to recognize the state role the state has played in this, but also recognize how in some ways this problem has grown much larger than many might realize. Thank you, Asim. Very well said. There's a very well documented instant from uh, late 1947 or early 1948, I think, basically I think uh, 1947, uh, right after Pakistan was created. Uh, during a Muslim League convention in Karachi, uh, Jinnah was present there and they were discussing the role of religion. So someone in the audience stood up, someone who didn't like what he was hearing. He stood up and said, Jinnah Saab, what should we tell the people? We told them Pakistan ka matlab kya la ilaha illa during the election. So Jinnah Saab at once told him to just sit down. Neither he nor any of his party said this and if anybody did, they did it for votes. That's what he said. But 35 years later, we saw the same slogan being turned into a national song during the Ziyas era. So we can see, uh, Rasul Sahib, in the light of what Salman has said, what do you expect your book to do to impact today's young man who, or a woman who is in college or high school? Like he's right that a lot of realities have changed and they're changing rapidly, in fact, too rapidly at this moment. So what can your narrative, where you have, in a way, uh, eulogized uh, uh, Islamic modernism and its importance in the Pakistan movement, how do you think is it important for him or her, a young Pakistani now? What can it do to change his mindset or her mindset? Actually, this is um, uh, an effort to understand the politics of Islamic revival. Actually, the original title was Disputed Destiny of Pakistan, Modernism State and Challenge of Radical Islam. So I, I changed it because uh, <coughs> I've never thought of living outside Pakistan. <laughs> so um, maybe I get that title back. In understanding this politics of Islamic revival, I think it is, it's not just one episode, one side of politics. 
I agree with the Sanjay Ved and that is one of my main argument because I couldn't sum up everything what I've written in the book. Is that that secular type of elite in Pakistan, the only exception is Ayub Khan who resisted that. But even um, the most popular leader from Zulfqar Ali Bhutto and many others and Liyakat Ali Khan has come to certain pressures from the ulama and particularly the influence of Mawana Shabir Ahmad Usmani and, and, um, and uh, Ishtiyak Sun Qureshi. Is that they thought that using Islamic wicket they can take away the wind out of the sails of the religious right, which had become very assertive and very much demanding, 1953, anti-Amdiya rats and all that. And they thought, okay, okay, you know. And the, the report, I think, that, that was taken as a, as a Bible by the political elite. When you look at then the decision of um, uh, Zulfkali Bhutu Sahib, at the apex of uh, PNA movement, Pakistan National Alliance movement. And he has whispered into his ears by, it is said that, Maulana Khosar Niazi and others, that instead of this Nizamin, Islamic Nizam uh, uh, movement, which, which basically PNA movement was called Nizam e Mustafa movement, Tariq e Nizam e Mustafa. And it were all secular parties like ANP were also part of that. So he said, you know, why don't you adopt this agenda? So my argument is, and that, that's, that, that you have to keep in mind, if you play on a wicket, which is the strong wicket of your political opponent, you're not going to win. Rather, they have given legitimacy, the question of legitimacy to the argument that an Islamic state has to be created. And if you want to create an Islamic state, is Daltana the right person? Is Firoz Khan the uh, right person? Is, or is it Maruna Maududi the right person? So generally, this argument has become so strong in Pakistan that it completely has um, ousted all other alternative perspectives or understanding of Pakistan's history. So my own request for intellectual, for politician, for media person, for the young man, is to, to examine historically the relationship of religion and power. And also understand the question that how religion in the past has been misused. And it can be misused. In, in, it is being misused in Pakistan. It, it will be misused further. So it is for the goodness of religion itself. It is the goodness and peace and harmony in the society. Uh, the second and last thing that I would like to, to talk about is that, that, um, that I, I disagree with Salman that, of course, Muslim modernity or modernism in Pakistan will be contextualized in Islamic history and Islamic civilization and Islamic culture. We, we cannot take away that symbolism, that we, we can't take away those influences that are at the grassroots level, deep down in the intellectual and historical imagination of the Muslim society. You, you can't be West and never try to be West. You will be Pakistan, you will be India, and you will be China, you will be what you have been. And, and, and don't, don't think other than that. But then how you build your political, institutions. So my engagement is with political modernism as well. You know, mainly. But what is political modernism? I don't think that there is a, any other system than a system of a representative government. How you make a representative government work, that depends again on your own intellectual genius, on convergence of interests among the elite. And the way you build a state, you build a nation, you can build political institutions. So here is the relevance of, of uh, colonial modernity. I agree with Dasan that the class infrastructure that, that created the same infrastructures that have taken over the state has become a partner. Which military government is, has, in Pakistan has been a pure military government. It has been a hybrid a government of a little bit of representation 
and a large political facade of PMLQ or Convention Muslim League or any other force that, that they have created or IGI, that they have to work with the same infrastructure that the British had created as an intermediary. And that is a failure. I believe that Pakistan's democracy could be a genuine democracy if we had introduced land reforms. We were very quick to do it in East Pakistan because the landlords happened to be Hindus.